the day that Austin City Council voted to remove parking mandates citywide in Austin was one of the greatest days of my life. Parking policy reveals values and priorities and morals in a very interesting way. People get mad and they're like, if you do this, it won't be safe for kids to walk down our street. And it's like, oh, it's not safe for kids to walk down your street. I value that. And let's talk about that. I would never have dreamed we would get to this point this fast. And even when it seemed like a crazy thing to do, people kept at it and then people joined and then people picked up the ball and kept it going. Welcome to Reinventing Parking, the podcast about parking policy for anyone who wants a better city and better urban transport. Welcome back. I'm your host, Paul Barter. On the 2nd of November 2023, the Austin City Council voted to end parking mandates, making Austin, Texas the largest municipality in the USA to do so, so far. That means no more parking mandates for the almost 1 million people at the core of a 3 million metropolitan area. But behind every parking reform success are people who worked for years to make it happen. I have with me today three of the key people from the Austin Parking Reform Coalition, which came together to get Austin to this point on parking reform. Leah Bojo is Director of Land Use and Entitlements with the Drenner Group, an Austin-based real estate boutique law firm. She played an important part in Austin's parking story in her role as a consultant, and before that, as policy director for Austin City Council member Chris Riley. Jay Crosley is executive director at Farm and City, which is a non-profit think and do tank dedicated to high quality urban and rural human habitat across Texas. Jay and Farm and City have been working on this reform for at least five years, in part also through Jay's role in the City of Austin Pedestrian Advisory Council, which in February 2019 recommended to the City Council to eliminate parking mandates. And Adam Greenfield is a community, public space, pedestrian and bicycle advocate based in Austin. He's currently executive director of Rethink 35, which is a grassroots movement fighting the planned I-35 highway expansion through Austin. In fact, you may have heard him recently on the Rethink 35 episode of the Strong Towns Bottom-Up Revolutions podcast. So let's get into it. Leah, Jay and Adam, thank you for joining me on the Reinventing Parking podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks for having us. Great to be here. I thought we might start with a very brief version of the whole parking reform story in Austin. So does anyone volunteer to to do that for us? So back in the early 2010s, the council office that I was working with and council member Chris Riley um, were some of the early leaders on thinking about parking reform for Austin. Um, It was a very different time as far as an appetite for parking reform. But we were believers and we started having the conversations, even though a lot of folks were not interested or thought we were uh, a little nuts. But we had Donald Shoup visit Austin, for example. We did some policy work around getting rid of parking minimums downtown. And at that time, I would say getting rid of parking mandates across the city was very hard to imagine. Okay. So it had this beginning in the early 2010s with this councillor's office. A lot of people, including some of the people here, have tried to reform parking in Austin for years and made some steps. But about two years ago, with various progress happening at Austin City Council and generally the atmosphere in place, a guy named Adam Greenfield essentially sent out the call to all the other nerds and said, you guys, it's time. We have to do this and we have to go for really getting rid of parking mandates. And a bunch of people heeded that call and said, oh, oh, okay, right, yes, it's time, let's do it. And so in my, in my mind, there, the campaign to end Austin parking mandates started then and then pretty quickly, amazingly quickly worked. However, there were years of things that were done by lots of different people to, to make that happen. Does anyone want to add anything to that quick summary? I would add that some of the early work, I think, that led to that moment, which was after the work that Chris and I did, Aura, a group in Austin, was asking candidates as they were running, would you support 
getting rid of parking mandates in Austin. So that seed was really started. And and then we ended up with a, a group of very progressive council members And then, of course, Adam, who should go next here, (laughs) finding that moment and realizing it and and making the call. Yeah, I I would probably put myself towards the chronological end of this story. But, you know, parking reform had been in in my awareness for a long time. I read Shoops, The High Cost of Free Parking back in 2010, and it blew my mind. I, I couldn't believe that a book about parking was blowing my mind. I was like, what am I even doing reading a book about parking? <laughs> <laughs> um, but in, in uh, 2021, my wife and I, one Saturday, decided to, we're cyclists. We don't take public transit very often. And we decided randomly to get a bus across town for no reason at all. And we found a, a line that looked good to us that kind of snakes its way north through Austin. So we got off at a pretty dismal part of Austin called West Anderson Lane. It's not a very nice place, but we're walking along this road and it's just a sea of parking. It is just absurd. And what actually kind of threw me eventually was we walked past a a three-story pit in the ground that was going to become parking. And, you know, some advocates say, well, that's better than surface parking, but it's still traffic generation. It's still more cars. It's still the wrong direction for our civilization. And I just lost it at that point. You know, I just I just I lost it right there on the sidewalk. And that was what pushed me to send out that email. And, you know, I'd, I'd been on the pedestrian advisory council when Jay had led the resolution that was passed in 2019 to recommend that. So it, there had already been momentum. But that, to me, is what just kind of pushed me over the edge, that historic walk along West Anderson Lane. I wish Anderson Lane was the only place in Austin where you would have that feeling. But that is absolutely not true. <laughs> so were Austin's parking mandates unusual in any way, or were they a typical United States set of parking mandates? There was a a process called Code Next to try to completely reform the city's land development code. And during that process, we did pin down some city staff and they actually figured out that on average, 1.7 parking spots were required per housing unit. Okay. And we actually did some math and that over 10 years, that it turns out to be about like $2 billion worth of parking that was required of the people of Austin to invest in as part of their housing. (laughs) Wow. And so you guys put together, you you and many other people managed to put together a coalition. Uh, Can can you share with the listener, perhaps to encourage uh, parking reformers elsewhere in, in the world, who do they need to reach out to? Who do they need to be talking to? Who should they be bringing into their coalitions? Yeah, initially the, the coalition started as people who, knew each other already fairly well you know there was there were uh, transportation land use advocates but within that there were you know university professor there were scrappy activists there were non-profit pros there were people you know in, in more in, on the development side but as we went on we needed to talk to more people and broaden that uh, one of the key groups we reached out to, and I think for a lot of listeners who want to be part of or are part of a parking reform campaign, disability rights advocates were absolutely key. So we we had various conversations with them. But also beyond that, speaking to other cities that had passed reform and their experiences, who they needed to talk to, how the experience went for them. Did they have any problems when reform was passed? hint, they didn't. All the all these kind of things. And, and of course, you know, decision makers were absolutely key as well. As we got closer to decision day, one of the tasks that I volunteered for was to put together a public facing compilation of supporters that was as broad as we could possibly make it. So that included, you know, people who do build homes and build buildings and, and that kind of thing, but also a, a popular pizza restaurant, a popular local brewery, a range of businesses, a range of organizations that would show the city of Austin decision makers this is an issue that has broad support. Mm-hmm. 
So Jay, your organization played this role of institutional and um, f- financial infrastructure, I guess, for the campaign. How, how important was it to have uh, one or more organizations able to p- fulfill that role? Yeah, we were able to be the fiscal sponsor of the coalition, and we actually raised $5,000 from kind of all of us just threw it together. So we actually hired somebody to start working full time. A guy named Daniel Cavillman was terrific at this. And we were able to partner with the Parking Reform Network and have a sort of direct relationship with Parking Reform Network. And so we had an infrastructure of just keeping this coalition going. Part of what Daniel's job was talking to different council offices or figuring out who needs to talk to who. It, it did work kind of terrifically how we were able to have this this kind of staff support to push the coalition's vision forward. How important was, or you know, what roles did the Parking Reform Network play behind the scenes? How did that work? Yeah, the, the Parking Reform Network was really, really helpful, and I would say critical. Um, and any campaign that is trying to reform parking should avail themselves of of the resources that they have. So first of all, the Parking Reform Network's map of other cities that have done this was incredibly helpful. That's that's how we found the cities that we reached out to to interview them. And a lot of the information on the website we stole, used, borrowed. Tony Jordan from the Parking Reform Network also attended numerous meetings. And I'll just speak for myself. I found even his presence in the room comforting because he has uh, the, the Eagles view um, and has seen what lots of other cities have done. And, and so he would chime in when necessary. And I think that's always really valuable to have someone there like that. Yeah. Um, so it just felt like we were part of a family. And I, that was just very, very helpful moving forward that there were resources at our fingertips if, if and when we needed them. I would also point out that the Parking Reform Network's list of cities became a regular talking point for another important advocate, Curtis Rogers, who showed up at many, many council meetings. And as cities were making these changes and getting rid of their mandates, he would sign up and just read the list of cities and peer cities that Austin likes to think that they are similar to. And he would just (laughs) point out repeatedly that that these cities were all getting rid of parking mandates in one way or another. And I think it was really uh, a fantastic and and politely persistent way to remind council of what they should be thinking about. Leah, I didn't know that. That's, oh. That is great. I did not know that. That's fantastic. It was fantastic. It was, he did a great job. Yep. Yeah. And th- this is the beauty of a broad coalition, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think that one thing that the, this coalition did that was hugely important, which we touched on a minute or two ago, is having a broad group. And if there was an issue that would come up, for example, um, ADA parking can often come up as something to be to be considered differently or the American Disabilities Act. The disab- as I understand it, there's sort of a divide in the ADA community or in the, in the disability advocates community. Some folks who use cars and, and need to use cars really rely on parking and want it to be free and available. And, and then other folks in the disability community don't drive or can't drive. So engaging that community and then being able to talk to the folks making the decisions about, yes, we have talked to these folks. This is what they have said. They are in the tent. They are part of the conversation. Goes a long way in making sure, say, an elected official knows that they're not about to maybe please one group, but alienate another. And so this was one where there was disagreement amongst our coalition. And we had a lot of national folks interested in this who were pushing back against the approach of including some kind of requirement for ADA parking spots. Mm -hmm. And I believe the end result is actually very smart and it basically maintains somewhat of a mandate to provide access to ADA parking spots, but is done in a manner in which we expect it will not block projects and it will not make projects more expensive the federal ADA legislation requires if you provide parking, you have to provide parking for people with disabilities. So yeah, so we we continued that. But in developments where there is no parking, there is a uh, requirement to make sure that there is access provided somehow. Yes. And that is what a bunch of people did not like. (laughs) But there, there is, there remains a requirement to provide ADA parking However, and I, I'm curious, 
Leah how this actually works out on projects, but the way it's done allows for an on-street parking spot to count and then the, thus the developer is required just to have a good sidewalk and to have the ability to get to the front door from there. There are certainly places downtown where a street space cannot be converted. Um, so I would say, you know, having a fee option to pay into a pot to put an ADA space somewhere, wherever nearby is, makes the most sense, you know, I think, or um, having the director have the ability to waive the requirement because it's not covered under federal law. Another yes. context for the ADA thing that may be important is that Austin, I think like a lot of American cities is under park is parking for people with disabilities. So there are, there are ongoing lawsuits with the city about their provision. So they they've dug themselves into a hole, which I think was part of the context for the situation now, which is that because we don't have enough ADA parking today, there was a real concern. So fingers crossed this reform that abolishes parking mandates may ironically make things better for people with disabilities who, who do need to drive. Oh, yes, I think it definitely would. A, a lot of the progress in, in a campaign like this is behind the scenes inside City Hall, right? Could you give other parking campaigners around the world some insight on how that worked in Austin? I would say that they were very important. And the person who led the charge is another fantastic parking reformer who is unfortunately is no longer with the city of Austin, Dan Hennessy, who is a believer and an advocate and and was able to understand exactly what the goals were, why they were, and, and do the work in a way that was really productive. Jay? It was crucial. There had been this giant land development code fight where there was an attempt to get rid of parking requirements during that. Um, and we, we were able to push it down to, I think, one parking spot per unit, but not further than that. And we lost the fight. But that the fact that those discussions about it had happened and all those council staff had been educated on this issue and had tried to, some of them maybe had fought against it. But a bunch of different people throughout the city were aware of the concepts and were aware of the trade-offs and were aware of the battle lines. And, and we weren't educating a bunch of council staffers from zero. Uh, so that was part of why this seemed like to kind of work amazingly well and very quickly is that there were good people throughout the city and outside the city that had a shared kind of knowledge base and way to talk about it. Timing was such a huge part of this, why this worked. And, and that wasn't entirely apparent to me on the day of my, my historic bus ride in my mind. Um, but, you know, just around this time, parking reform was really starting to get hot in the U.S. And there were more and more articles coming out. And I remember when I was presenting on this issue to the Design Commission, which is a city of Austin body, trying to get the Design Commission to sign on as a supporter of this. And I could just tell that almost everyone in the room just got this. They've, they've read enough articles, more and more policymakers and decision makers have heard about it and it just makes sense to them. And that was also very helpful to us. Back in, you know, around 2010, 11, 12, when, when I was working with Chris Riley on so many of these reforms, we brought forward a proposal to eliminate parking minimums for micro units on transit corridors no parking if your unit was under 400 square feet and on a, a predetermined transit corridor, we couldn't get it done. They, they, <laughs> they ended up making it 0.25 oh, okay. um, in those 10 years or 12 years. I mean, the mindset shift is just unbelievable. I'm thinking of someone who's indignant about parking, like Adam was on the on his uh, famous bus ride, but they haven't yet got to the point of uh, being perhaps empowered as an act activist. And maybe they're thinking, is it just like going to be a thankless struggle for years? What would you say to that person to encourage them that maybe there are w wins along the way, there are fun people that you can work with, etc. <laughs> Very fun people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had such a good time in this campaign. I mean, because it's such a, a defined issue and the the outcomes over time are, are so clear. I mean, looking at what, what has happened in other cities, this in, in some ways, this was the best campaign I've ever worked on. So I, I'm I'm in transportation advocacy, although I would say on this issue, I was closer to being a normie than, you know, much closer than than Jay or Leah. And so I kind of brought with me my everyday person hat to some extent. I was not an expert in parking by any means. 
But the conversations were fascinating. The alliances, the the supporters collecting them and learning how to talk about the issue, making the calculations about what decision makers think what and that kind of thing, figuring out what other cities did. I thought the whole thing was just endlessly fascinating. And I think I will be a lifelong lover of parking reform just for that reason, because it's just so interesting. And the the impacts of, of any parking reform can be profound over time. The, the day that Austin City Council voted to remove parking mandates citywide in Austin was one of the greatest days of my life. Fantastic. It's awesome. I, I would add to the person wondering if this is worth the fight that it's really interesting to me that the way this fight worked, that parking policy reveals values and priorities and morals in a very interesting way. It, it, people get mad and they're like, well, if you do this, it won't be safe for kids to walk down our street. And it's like, oh, it's not safe for kids to walk down your street. I value that. And let's talk about that. And in a funny way, how these Austin debates over this sort of seemingly esoteric thing in a way has helped refine the values of the city of Austin. <laughs> and like, yes, we, we actually value humans having homes more than cars. And we didn't, we didn't know that clearly before, but now we get that. And it's somewhat, it's somewhat nice to be part of that <laughs> sort of clarifying your community values. Um, and it somehow works well with parking policy. <laughs> huh. Yeah. I would never have dreamed we would get to this point this fast and we did because so many people stuck with it and, and they laid the groundwork and they kept at it. And even when it seemed like a crazy thing to do, people kept at it and then people joined and then people picked up the ball and kept it going. And, and it just, you have to stick with it. You really do. And But like we can see this wave across the country of change. And so clearly it's happening and it'll eventually get to, I hope, everywhere. And it may take a while. There may be some really ugly council meetings. Uh, and I, at one point, the board of the Austin Independent School District had taken a position in favor of requiring more parking for, for various reasons. And we built a coalition to write a letter in response. And we took a lot of heat for that. But those things actually helped bring up these issues and resolve them and work through them. And so you might lose the fight this next month, but that if you engage with people respectfully and keep going, it's worth it. And you may be preparing for real meaningful change that actually improves people's lives, but be ready for not immediately getting satisfaction. <laughs> it will be a rocky road. Yeah. <laughs> Almost always. One of the things that Donald Shoup has talked about over the years is a little bit of frustration in that he's put forward this call for change and the resistance to it is all kind of passive aggressive. Very few people explicitly defending parking mandates. But on the ground in places like Austin, you do very much get pushback. Any reflections on that issue of pushback? One of the key pieces of research that a campaign needs to do as early as possible, I think, is to understand what are the local concerns that you've been hearing? What are the local sensitivities? What's the local political culture like? What kind of arguments resonate and don't resonate? You know, when we were reaching out to other cities to ask how they passed reform and did they have any problems after it had been passed, we were conscious that Austin, like many cities, likes to see what has happened elsewhere, especially in cities that are similar to us. So our Austin Parking Reform Coalition website, you'll see a comparison with other cities that have similar density to us, similar population to us similar transit score to us, you know, because people always say, well, it, it worked over there, but it wouldn't work here. And actually, some of our peers, very similar to us, had already passed reform, and that, and that was very helpful. But there are other things as well, you know, we'd heard concerns from people about overflow of parked cars onto neighborhood streets, parked cars near schools, how this will impact people with disabilities and, and low-income community members. And, and so on and so forth. So we, we just listened to those arguments and, and compiled them and made sure we were able to address them. 
Yeah, so I, I would urge the listener to go take a look at that uh, Austin Parking Reform Coalition website. One section that was particularly striking and relevant, I've forgotten the name of the section. Your burning questions. And that, that burning question section was also written in regular language, which I think is maybe yeah. something worth pointing out. I think those of us who've been in it and really deep in it and really like the data and the, the nerdiness can forget that in order to form a coalition, you have to be able to talk to regular people about their regular mm. experiences with parking and their regular yeah. concerns. Which I might add there that you do need some nerds. And, oh, sure. you know, one way to portray it is that there was a 13 year game of whack-a-mole of all the excuses and that we did have different people at different levels taking people seriously and like, okay, your concern today is this and then elaborate responses and like actually work through it and actually talk about, well, well, you know what? We also are concerned about pedestrian safety on small neighborhood streets. And by the time this was a public campaign, the nerds had respected and defeated, you know, amongst the policy groups, uh, a lot of these arguments, and we were ready. Could I move on to another big strategic question? There's a bunch of cities that I've uh, interviewed people about on this podcast about their parking reforms. And uh, a number of them are like Austin, where there was a full frontal assault on the parking mandates. But then there's a cluster of cities uh, such as Sao Paulo in Brazil and uh, some, some municipalities in the Sydney area where the parking reforms were linked with a wider reform, such as some kind of sustainable transport or an ambitious reform to the whole planning system. And abolishing parking mandates was just part of that. Did you consider trying to perhaps attach parking reform to some other popular agenda and, and uh, pass it in that? way or you decided to go for it directly i mean yeah it was part of this giant land use reform package and there were Ah. attempts to have it in that and for Mm -hmm. other reasons that reform package stalled out however i we would not have achieved this if that fight hadn't happened during the code next reform package uh, so in some ways, it worked brilliantly for the pure frontal assault on parking mandates that we'd actually been through this fight as part of a giant reform package. Okay, interesting. Part of this is we were, at Farm City, we were, we were trying everything we could do. And so <laughs> there, there is work on equitable transit-oriented development happening in Austin, and those are now moving forward. But at the time, the, one of the strategies that we were doing <laughs> was eliminate parking requirements as part of the ETOD within walking distance of transit. And we were educating council staffers on that concept. And then we lead Vision Zero Texas, the movement to end traffic deaths in Texas. And so we had a particular angle on parking requirements at bars and had floated a bill at the state legislature, but then had floated this concept at Austin City Council. And then an Austin City Council member actually kind of right before the citywide parking mandates passed, passed the get rid of parking requirements at bars just a couple months before. And so there were a suite of approaches happening, but it sort of, we coalesced around, okay, we're going to go for it. This get rid of the whole thing. Okay. But it, it's yeah. certainly... You know, it, the context will vary city by city, and it depends. You know, uh, some of our peer cities that pass citywide reform, they included it in some kind of land use rewrite plan. We did it as a standalone thing. It could be either. And, you know, there was also one of the other issues I think that probably a lot of campaigns perhaps face is how much do we push for? Do we go for full removal of mandates citywide, no qualifications, keep it clean, keep it pure, keep it simple, go for the gold standard. You know, are we reading the political tea leaves and we think that, you know, right now only removing mandates within half a mile of trans high, high capacity transit or something like that is possible. And we certainly had those debates as well. What should we push for? And we tried to hold the line. Well, we did hold the line because we won. But you know, we didn't want to give cards away from our hand unless we had to. And if anyone was going to try and take us down a few notches, well, we weren't going to give those cards away easily. And yeah, and not yeah. be afraid of incrementalism, right? I mean, if if you're in a position where you can't get exactly what you want, I would I would argue get what you can get, you know, because then maybe it maybe a little while later you'll get the rest. Yeah, discouraged. That- 
And that, that's a good segue into the next question. There's often this question with parking reform of which, which should come first, abolishing parking mandates or establishing decent on-street parking management and other checks and balances to make sure that you've got some answer to, to, the, to the concerns people have. Um, so in the Austin case, you had this precedent of abolishing mandates downtown as well as adjacent to downtown places like, I, I believe, West Campus. Then some on-street parking management improvements were made in West Campus. And I believe, Leo, you were involved in that, uh, a parking benefit district. And more recently, yes. some changes that are happening in South Congress. You know, how important were those other things that were happening that you could point to them and say, look, we did something similar and, and the sky didn't fall? I think it was part of the whole comprehensive conversation in a way that was really important. And so... That early conversation about parking benefit districts in West Campus, which led to a program that's been adopted in several neighborhoods across the city, and, and all of those other parking reform items, street patios, all of those items, I think, were little notches away at people realizing this is a space, it doesn't have to be used for this, it can be parking, but it could be charged, it could be managed, or it could be something else. Which I- I really think to put a point on that, that specifically the West Campus treatment, the university neighborhood overlay that, that Leah helped make happen, we certainly were trying to use that with council office and explain like, look, it, it's okay. And you can figure out parking and you can figure out ways to actually make these people love it. And people love the West Campus has good sidewalks now and the benefits of the parking benefit district are great. But the fact that we had seen these improvements in Austin in a real example where where parking had been decoupled from housing units and things really helped kind of assuage the fears. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. the fact that, that that incremental fight had been won a decade ago uh, and that it actually had worked and improved people's lives <laughs> really made this much easier. <laughs> much to many of their surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you anticipate uh, further parking-related uh, campaigns, or is it now more of a sort of a, something that will happen perhaps uh, in a more administrative way? Parking problems might emerge in areas where there's infill, and a parking benefit district would be the obvious answer, and there would be no need for activists to be involved. Parking benefit districts, which are also called parking and transportation management districts in Austin, but are, but are the same concept, um, do require council approval. Um, The good news is that the first one was quite controversial, uh, and now the most recent one that was approved, I believe, went on the consent agenda with little to no discussion. So again, that progress is is happening. We should be moving more and more of those things to administrative processes, but I think there are still some fights that have to happen and that will have to happen publicly, and I think will have to happen with the help of a coalition if we're going to get our parking under control, both management and production or, or construction of it. I had one more question about the politics. In the case of Austin, the coalition seems to have been from a more progressive and environmentally minded and social justice kind of set of agendas. But did you also draw in any conservative people and organizations into the coalition? The Austin City Council has one Republican member uh, and then 10 Democrats. So the political reality here is that it was mostly going to be Democrats technically passing this or not. But uh, we certainly did quite a lot to try to make sure this was not seen as some kind of crazy liberal issue and to portray it within a, a reforming bureaucracy to allow markets to provide people with affordable lifestyles and things. Um, And so uh, I think it's crucial for the movement um, that this wasn't done in some kind of partisan way. That's one of the the many reasons that I I so love parking reform, especially specifically removing parking mandates, because it is an issue that resonates, I think, with people who who see themselves on different parts of the political spectrum. And it, it, it was just fascinating talking to the other cities that had passed reform and hearing what arguments had worked for them. I spoke to one small town mayor just to the east of Austin, a, a small town called Bastrop. And, and what resonated for, for her was the free market. She kept talking about the free market and, and let that decide. And that was something that resonated over there. In another city, it could be something else. But mm-hmm. it, it's just a lot of fun to be able to go to different groups and make the pitch that resonates with them. 
Austin is extremely car dependent. And if there are concerns in listener cities that we can't do this because we rely on cars too much, that is probably not a valid excuse because Austin has done it. Now that Austin has done it, you can do it too. It's one of the great joys of this is that every domino that falls changes the context for every other campaign. And this is just becoming more and more normal. It's becoming more and more common sense. So there's just no good reason. Now that Austin has done it, there's no good reason why you can't do it too. So I'll add a funny stat to that, that if you look at vehicle miles traveled per capita, Austin is worse than other Texas major metros. And actually amongst all the top 50 major metros in the nation, the people of Austin drive more on average than every other major metro other than Atlanta. So only Atlanta drives more than Austin. And we, oh, yeah. we were able to get this done. So I think it's, and it's fine. And it turns out everybody's happy. <laughs> parking reform is not the end of the story. At least parking mandates will not be getting in the way of the other things that need to be done in Austin to reduce that VMT runner up to Atlanta. It, it's a great achievement. So congratulations, everybody, for, for that win. And thank you so much for being on the Reinventing Parking podcast, which is the Parking Reform Network podcast. Thank you so much for doing this and for for talking to the people across the nation and across the world on fixing the scourge of parking mandates. It feels so good. Go for it, everyone. It feels so good. Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you for having us, Paul. You've been listening to the Reinventing Parking podcast, and I'm Paul Barter. You can find out more at reinventingparking.org, where you'll find ideas and tips on parking policy. You can also listen to other episodes, subscribe, or leave a comment. That's reinventingparking.org. Bye for now.